Jetting off on an international vacation really isn't an option in the midst of a global pandemic. But you can still escape to the beauty of romantic southwestern France, the complexities of its wines, rich aromas of its foods, plus enjoy a little mystery at the same time. That's why I write them. I really want to sort of share this amazing place and all of its, all of its treasures and pleasures with others. Martin Walker's latest book in his internationally acclaimed Bruno Chipa Police series once again stars the charming village police officer, but also the Perigore, a region rich in history and gastronomy. Which reminds me I'm getting a little bit thirsty, so <laughs> your very good health. Two areas Walker can speak expertly and excitedly about. He has a home in the region, a history degree from Oxford, and two award-winning cookbooks written in German. An English version is on the way. In the shooting at Chateau Rock, he also uses his background as a former bureau chief for The Guardian in Moscow to add a thought-provoking Russian mystery. As always, we go from the lovely little Perigord, sheep farms, food and wine, into a bit of high international politics and skullduggery. And there's music too, inspired by the British rock stars who lived in the area in the 70s and 80s, people Walker wrote about early in his career. Can you imagine? I mean, I was what the French call le roi des carottes, the king of carrots. I had a great time. In this conversation, Walker not only talks about the significance of the novel's music, including the song you've been listening to since the start of this video, he also serenades us. Et finalement, finalement, il nous fallait bien du talent d'être vieux. Touches on where he draws the line of similarities between his life and Bruno's. I wouldn't dare put any of them into a novel. And shares some of his favorites from the Perigord. The fact that I'm able to serve to, to include that wine in my own Cuvée Bruno. Oh yes, it's, it's like the history is right there. Martin Walker, thank you so much for joining us from your home in the Paragard. Is that right? Well, that's where I am right now. And sadly, I'm not going to be able to come to the States as planned uh, this summer because of this virus. And indeed, I should have been in Germany now doing a book tour there. But again, we have been uh, locked down in France since early March. And the, the main problem is that my wife has been locked down in London. Oh, so, no. Oh, yes. So you can't go anywhere, you're stuck there, and, and she's stuck in London. Well, until, until a few days ago, I wasn't really allowed to leave my house and garden unless I had something called an attestation, which was a, an official statement uh, signed and sealed that I was just going for a small trip to get some, either to the doctors or to get some essential, uh, essential foods or something. They were really very strict about it. Uh, here in France, and they would fine people heavily if they didn't have this attestation. But as of the last few days, we can travel within our département, like within our state, within our little region, for a distance of about 60 miles from our home. Uh, anything more than that is a no-no. That must have been so difficult for you because I know from your books you talk about how being together and sharing food and preparing food together is such a large part of life there. It's absolutely a central part of life and we've sort of found ways around it because so many of my friends are, are neighbors in this little village where I live. I'm in a, a small hamlet. It hasn't even got a proper name. The French call it a lieu de, a place that is called. Oh. At us. And um, <laughs> we're about 50 souls in this hamlet. We all know each other very well. And of an evening, around about 6.30, we tend to meet for what the French call a petit apéro, which is, you know, a glass of, uh, of whiskey or of, uh, of ricard or a glass of wine or whatever. And we sit and chat over the things of the day. And I've got in my garden, I have this very large table where four men can sit with a, a good distance of about a meter apart. And so we can have a drink, chat away, and we can even have a barbecue as long as we maintain that distance. So it hasn't been that bad. I've had the garden. 
I've had the dog. I've had my books, my wine. I've had a book to write and uh, a book to edit. And um, so I've kept pretty busy, but it's not the same. <laughs> well, I will tell you that reading your book was a welcome escape from, <laughs> from my house. I felt like I was getting to visit the Paracord. So that was very exciting for me, which is an area that I didn't know much about. It's a very special part of the world. It's, um, it's not even 100% France. It's much older than France. I mean, most of what we know from pre about prehistory, about Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon people, we've learned from this valley of the River Verzaire, where, where I live. And people, a lot of people have heard of the Lascaux Caves, this masterpiece of prehistoric art, but it goes back much, much earlier than that. Lascaux was about 18,000 years ago. And if I walk out of my house towards the village, I will go past a, a small rock shelter called La Ferracie. And it's the oldest known cemetery on earth. And there are eight people were buried there. It's the first time human beings buried each other with ritual and with respect, with stones built around the skulls and the heads, with some flowers around the neck of the woman. And it's 72,000 years old. So that's how far this place goes back. Now, until very recently, we had our own language here called Occitan, which the Parisians tried to crush on the grounds they wanted to have a single French state. Um, but a lot of my friends, a lot of my neighbors still speak the old Patois. It's uh, their telephone answering uh, message is in Patois. Yeah. And uh, it's, so it, it feels a bit different and uh, they don't take Parisian fads very seriously down here. I love that we're talking to you. I mean, I'd, I'd love to be in person with you, but the fact that you're there and this was such an inspiration for the Bruno series, right? That's where you got all this inspiration to, to write this? Absolutely. I mean, I, I often think that um, although I have this hero, this little local village policeman called Bruno, one of the main characters uh, in my novels is the Perigord itself. The, the history, the climate, the landscape, the wines, the special food, because it's such an important part of everybody's life here. And um, my wife said to me once, because we were foreign correspondents, we were based in Washington and in Moscow, in Asia. And uh, my wife said, look, we really need to have a place that is a fixed home for the kids. And she found this place. And that was 22 years ago. And at first it was a holiday home, but now it's much, much more than that. And uh, it was here I began writing novels. It doesn't take long to start noticing a lot of parallels between Bruno and your life. I mean, obviously the paracord. You have a basset hound, correct? You do. With you the same name, Balzac. You have the, the garden you mentioned. And then I think I've, I've seen that you have several friends who look a lot like the friends of Bruno's, or even Bruno himself. Well, that's, that, that's true. And in fact, many of the male characters have their inspiration from one of my friends or neighbors. So the character called the Baron, there is a Baron who lives in this little hamlet. The Jean-Jacques uh, is, comes a great deal from my neighbor Raymond, who is a retired gendarme. He used to be one of Jacques Chirac's bodyguards, President Chirac. Uh, and he's full of great stories. And uh, he's the guy I tend to go off on vineyard visits with because uh, I, write a, I write a column for a local newspaper about wine, and, mm. which means we have to go and visit lots of vineyards. And, and then the mayor is, of course, the mayor. Um, and uh, he, he's always delighted he's never yet been the murderer. <laughs> <laughs> but, and Bruno was the original inspiration, was a guy I met at the local tennis club who had been 10 years in the French army, spends his spare time teaching the boys and girls at school to play tennis in summer, rugby in winter. He's a great cook, a hunter, and our village policeman called Pierrot. And he delights in the fact that he's now become a kind of a tourist attraction. Because in summer on market day, when we don't have this lockdown, we'll get people you know, coming to the market day and they'll be looking around for somebody in police uniform. And then in various languages, Swedish or German or Japanese, whatever, they will say, uh, et vous, Bruno. <laughs> and he's asked me to 
for a few words in different languages. So he will click his heels and say, Yavol, and salute. And then he will sign the book <laughs> and he will stand for a selfie with uh, the Fraulein or whatever. And he loves it. So most of your friends are fine with it. Obviously, you haven't made your friends murderers or anything like that. Or, oh, no, no. Or My friends are always the good guys. And the interesting thing is that I would not dare uh, try and find a woman to become a character. I have to invent the women altogether. I mean, I wouldn't dare try and put any of my friends, my daughters, my wife, my wife's friends, my sister-in-law, I wouldn't dare put any of them into a novel. So I just have to invent the women. So. And why is that? Why won't you go there? Um, well, shyness in a way, um, knowing my wife <laughs> in a way, uh, but it's also, I find women very mysterious and very different. And I've yet to meet any man who says he understands women. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you are, you are from Venus and that's <laughs> half of your attraction. Um, which is, there's, and there's another side to that, which is that you might have noticed I never have any over sex scenes in my novels. You know, I'm a great believer in the old Hollywood, uh, Hollywood cliche of passionate embrace and then came the dawn. You know? Right. So, yes. And the reason for that is I, I've got these two daughters. I would be so hideously embarrassed if they were to find themselves you know, reading some sex scene written by their father. So, <laughs> <laughs> indeed, I mean, I, I had a taste of this with my wife, with Julia, because she's also written a few novels herself. And when we were based in Moscow, she wrote one. And the novel was based around a, a couple, a, a British journalist based in Moscow, um, who was well-meaning, but a bit of a duffer. And, you know, and his brilliant wife, who saved him from all sorts of problems and so on. And there came a moment when I suddenly realized, oh God, I'm about to read a sex scene written by my wife. And then I turned the page and thank God there was only a very short amount before the chapter ended. And basically we went straight into fireworks bursting out over the Kremlin. <laughs> and that was it. So, so I was relieved about that. But then in this book, I actually do write a sex scene, but it is not human. It's time for Balzac to become a daddy. And so they find this wonderful female basset, Diane de Poitiers, named after the mistress of a French king. And uh, Bruno is, uh, and his basset uh, are, are there for this uh, extraordinary moment in the life of a young dog. <laughs> well, you, it seems like you save the details as well for, for the cooking. The, the cooking scenes are, are sometimes almost sensual or the description of the wines and things of that sort, the land, that is, that's where the, the detail comes in, isn't it? Well, indeed. And I, I mean, the, the cooking, cooking is such is so much at the heart, food and cooking is so much at the heart of France and the great tradition of France. And this is the culinary heartland of France here, the Perigord. Um, I mean, it's the whole, it was where the, it was the base of the only, of the only French king who gave his name to a dish, and that is poulet Henri IV, or chicken in the manner of King Henry IV. He was a wonderful, a wonderful king, still the most popular king. And he once said, ah, the Perigord. Great cooking, wonderful wines, this is paradise on earth. And he was absolutely right. And he was living at the end of the, uh, the, end of the 16th century. Food is, is hugely important. And I, the good news I can give you is we'd done a couple of cookbooks which had been published in Europe and indeed had won prizes there. So I kept being asked by American fans, when do we get the cookbook? Well, Knopf have agreed they're going to bring out a Bruno cookbook in Wonderful. English. Wonderful. Coming next year. And uh, in fact, now I have to admit, most of the cooking is done by Julia. And... I write the twiddly bits in between the recipes. You know, I write about, you know, the lovely landscape and the food and, but, and the wine. And, and, but Julia does the hard part. And uh, I do some of the cooking, but uh, I'm very much the junior partner in that. But 
every time there is a meal uh, or any dish that is being cooked by Bruno, I have to cook it myself. But with Julia standing at my shoulder and saying, not so much garlic or a bit more salt or, uh, and, uh, but it, it's, it's great fun working with my wife. And for the last couple of months, we've had to be working remotely or rather like this over video and, and conversations and sending documents back and forth for this English version of the, of the cookbook. It's been, it's been interesting, but, but pretty tough in a way as well. <laughs> this is your 15th Bruno book. Is that 14th. correct? 14th. I've read somewhere that he's kind of developed a voice for you. Like you've gotten to know him and so much so that even when you put him in some situations that you think he's going to be in, it's almost like he won't let you. That's right. I mean, there was, there was one, one novel, which was called The Devil's Cave, but the Germans had a much better title for it. They called it Femme Fatale. And in my plan for the novel, there is this very attractive but dangerous woman who wants to seduce Bruno for her own nefarious purposes. And in my plan, you know, Bruno, he's only a guy, you know, he succumbs. But when I came to write this actual scene of, you know, this woman is preparing to pounce, it was like a force field was coming out of my desk saying, I'm not gonna drop my trousers for this woman, <laughs> no way. So I had, to, I had to rewrite the whole of the ending. I mean, it was, uh, and it, it, more and more, he's got this life of, they take on lives of their own, but it's not just Bruno. It's all this group of friends around him. It makes him so real, because it's the things that he does, the people that he meets, they're all very real. Well, this, this is the thing about, about, about a novel, is that you know, it's easy to get carried away with the grand story, but real life has to take place. I get baffled when I read a novel in which nobody eats. <laughs> I, mean, I, eat, I eat every day, two or three times. And you know, often you will go through an entire crime story. Nobody stops even for a sandwich. I mean, it's, it's uh, what do they live on? I mean, <laughs> you've got to go shopping. You, you've got to walk the dog. You've got to cook. You've got to eat. You've got to say hello to your neighbors and, and uh, I mean, this is what real life is. I mean, John Lennon once said that, you know, life is what happens when you are making other plans. And that is, I think, a, a, a watchword for novelists. The novel, you know, is the real life is what happens when you as a novelist are making other plans for your characters. No, they've got to eat. They've got to go to the bathroom. You know, <laughs> they've, they've got to fall ill or something. Things happen. Well, speaking of food, you've become quite the ambassador for, for that region of Perigord. But you've also become the judge of what, the foie gras? I have, yes. I'm a chevalier. I'm a chevalier of the Pâté de Perigueux, uh, which is a group of us, about 25 of us. And we have to get dressed up in medieval robes once a year for the big day when we introduce new members into the confrérie, into the brotherhood. When I was introduced, I was, uh, the mayor made a speech, mayor of Perigueux made a speech, kissed me on both cheeks and then baptized me on each shoulder with a duck. <laughs> 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 and ever since then, I've had to sit in on the annual uh, choice of the best foie gras of the year. I also do the same for another tradition, uh, which is called the, uh, the Chabrol, which is when we have soup. Um, in the, we always have soup to begin in the Perigord and you never finish your soup because you leave some in the bottom of the bowl and you pour in some red wine and then you pick it up and you go and you drink it all like that and that's called Fer Chabrol and I'm a member of the Conferie of Chabrol as well and, uh, and then we have the wine I'm a, I'm a grand consul of the Consulat de la Vigne de Bejerac which was founded in the year 1254 it means that I'm one of the people who has to uh, help select the wines we will send to the great ex exhibitions in Paris, or I have to sit on juries for picking the wines of the year. And it's, it's, it's a tough job, but somebody has to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I'm I just first, was wondering... I'm the first Scotsman in all of these 800 years to be a grand consul. So I'm very proud of that. 
<laughs> Very good. Well, I was wondering then if we could use some of your expertise to perhaps um, show us some of the specialties of that region. Well, um, here is the classic speciality, and this is foie gras. And we'll hold it up a little bit higher for us to see. There. And you see it all right? Yes, yes, yes. Foie gras simply means um, fat liver. And a lot of people, a lot of greens will say, oh, it's terribly cruel um, that the birds have their livers stuffed so that they get enlarged. In fact, it's entirely natural. Ducks and geese are birds of migration. They fly hundreds of miles every spring and fall. And wh where do they get the energy for that? They stuff themselves so that their liver swells three, four times normal size, and that's where they keep their energy. So if you don't like the idea of foie gras, don't blame Perigord, blame God. He designed this system. <laughs> and it is just delicious. It really is. So foie gras is one classic thing. And then the piece de resistance, of course, is wine. Of course. And um, I make my own wine. And it's called uh, the Cuvée Bruno. When you can see the dog, the Basset Hound, on the label, wearing a French policeman's helmet. Okay. And it's a pretty good wine. It's a Bergerac wine. And we make about 6,000 bottles every year, about half of which go to export, mainly to Germany and Britain. Half of them uh, get drunk in France, quite a few of them by me and my friends. <laughs> but, uh, you're very good health. Thank you. Wow, I wish I were there to enjoy that with you. It looks fabulous. Well, when you can, you'll have to come. It's a pretty nice wine. It's a mixture of, of Cabernet Sauvignon, um, Merlot, and a little bit of Malbec, which is a very old grape in this part of the world. We call it Cote, and it was the wine that was served at the wedding of Eleanor of Aquitaine when she married the future King Henry II of England. And, of course, by marrying, by the Duchess of Aquitaine, marrying the King of England, the lands came together and that started the 300 years of the Anglo-French wars. Henry V at Agincourt and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that I'm able to serve, to, to include that wine in my own Cuvée Bruno, oh yes, it's, it's like the history is right there. I also have to ask about the music in shooting at Chateau Rock. There's, there's quite a bit of, of music in it. And as you read it, you can almost feel how beautiful it, it would sound. Um, I was wondering if there was significance between, behind the songs that you selected. Yes, there is. Back when the world was young, and so was I, in the early 70s, when I was a young journalist for the, with The Guardian, I was a, writing about politics and so on. But I noticed that we didn't have anybody writing about rock music. Now, this is the early 70s, you know, when it was the dominant cultural form for most young people. So I went to the editor and I said, look, we've got to start doing something about this. And he said, well, OK, you do it, but do it in your spare time and you've got to continue with your ordinary work. I had a whale of a time. So Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Guess who was there at the premiere? London Planetarium. There I was. The, book, the Dawn of Ziggy Stardust, I was there, interviewing David Bowie. Uh, the Launch of Quadrophenia by The Who, I was, Procol Hara. I mean, I had a wonderful time, a whale of a time, interviewing Michael J Mick Jagger. I went to the big ball that he threw for Bianca at Blenheim Palace. So, no, can you imagine? I mean, I was what the French call Le Roi de Carot, the King of Carrots. I had a great time. Um, and I loved that music. And then punk came along and I began to lose interest a bit. But, and I began, as I got older, to get more and more interested in classical music. And I was particularly, I really became passionate about classical music in Moscow because whatever else that regime did, they had a very good conservatoire and they had wonderful concerts, wonderful ballet, wonderful opera. Um, and I came across some of the Russian Orthodox liturgical music, the church music, some of which had been written by Tchaikovsky, the hymn of the Cherubim, for example. And I, I, I was just blown away by this. And then I've always loved Schubert, so I brought that in. And I thought, okay, we've got this old rocker who's a great guitarist, 
and his son is a brilliant uh, acoustic guitarist, why don't I get them together to play the Concierto de Aranjuez by Rodrigo, which is a wonderful, wonderful piece. And I just sort of invented that and how a slide guitar might work in with that sort of sub bolero Spanish rhythm of the, uh, of the concierto, of the concierto. I had a wonderful time doing all that. I really did. And um, I mean, what's the point of writing novels if, if I can't enjoy doing it? You mentioned earlier that you're supposed to be on book tour right now in Germany. And, and sometimes I, I read that you will even sing during those book tours if it applies I, to the book. I just thought I would sing in the shower. And then there was, um, there was one particular novel in which I was writing. I, I, I was, uh, Bruno was ill and Pamela goes to see him sick in bed and she's playing some music and she puts on the immortal song of Jacques Brel, uh, La Chanson des Vieux Amants, the song of old lovers. And I, I think I'd had perhaps a glass too many of wine before the reception. So I just burst into song. And I sang it and everybody both stood up and applauded and shouted more, more, more. So I began singing along with the, uh, um, along with my readings and uh, which next time I'm come to St. Louis, I'll sing for you. All right. I was, I was going to ask if you were going to give us a little sneak peek of that, but we'll have to wait. No. Um, bien sûr, nous sommes des orages. Vingt ans d'amour, c'est l'amour folle. Mille fois tout prix. Tes bagages, mille fois j'ai pris mon envol. Mais chaque meuble se souvient dans cette chambre sans berceau, des éclats des vieilles tempêtes. Et finalement, finalement, il nous fallait bien du talent d'être vieux sans être adulte. Oh mon amour, mon doux, mon tendre, mon merveilleux amour, de l'aube claire jusqu'à la fin du jour, je t'aime encore, tu sais, je t'aime. <laughs> oh, bravo, bravo. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing that for us. My pleasure. <laughs> this has been such a fun conversation with you. I have just oh. one more thing that I'm sure readers uh, want to know, and that is Bruno Books. I know you're working on some more, but there, there's no chance of you retiring anytime soon. We don't need to worry about that, do we? No, the one for next year is already written. And I'm working on the one for 2022. And I have an idea or two in my head for the future. <laughs> I've always written since I was a little boy. I used to follow my mother around the house, reading little poems or little stories I've written. I mean, I, was, I must have been a terrible, obnoxious child. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, look where you are now. So it all, it all worked out. Yeah, it's, it's one of the great regrets of my life is although my my mum had uh, my mum and my father had read my my nonfiction books, you know, History of the Cold War, a book about Gorbachev, and so on. She never read the Bruno novels, and I think she'd have loved them. So I often, you know, if I have a kind of a, uh, an act, a, a, a basic reader in mind, it's probably my mum. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much. À la prochaine, as we say. À la prochaine. Like, it's like au revoir, which is till we see each other again, but à la prochaine, till next time. Mm -hmm.